Greetings and welcome to St. Mary's Episcopal Church in Kinston, North Carolina. Welcome to God's house, where it is good for us to be together in this way, to offer our gifts of praise and thanksgiving. My name is Tom Warren, and I have the privilege of serving as the rector here at St. Mary's, and I welcome you on this 20th Sunday after the Feast of Pentecost. This is a very special day in the life of the church, uh, for we will, at the 1030 liturgy, be celebrating the baptism of of Wells Theodore Means. Wells is the son of Abby and Trey Means and will be the newest member of the household of God. If you haven't already, I invite you to pull up the bulletin for today's worship service. It will guide you through what we are about to do today, which, because of Wells's baptism, will include a renewal of our own baptismal vows. We do that at every other liturgy of a Sunday morning, whenever there is a baptism at any of the other ones. This is a sign of our common life together through Jesus. Um, also, at the back of the bulletin, there are a number of announcements pertaining to life and ministry from St. Mary's Church. There are so many things going on. Greg's ordination is coming up, uh, trunk or treat, information about mission opportunities, one to Glory Ridge in the spring and right after Easter, one uh, for youth in particular that will be for uh, the summertime. Uh, please read all of that. But there are two that I need to highlight in particular. First is that next Sunday is Consecration Sunday. That is the Sunday at which members and friends of St. Mary's Church, as a part of their worship together, as a private moment during the 1030 liturgy, will be able to offer their estimate of giving card, uh, which is an indication of what they sense, a percentage of their income that they believe God is calling them to give in the next year. Um, if you are not someone who is able to worship with us at the 1030 liturgy, uh, that will be the only in-person liturgy that day, uh, then please know that there will be an email or some other way that uh, will be made known that you can uh, share your estimate of giving if that's something that you believe you are called to participate in. Um, also, after the liturgy that day in, in the in-person service, there will be a celebration luncheon in Mosley Hall. Uh, if you haven't already, please contact the church office uh, Lori Kelly there, either by calling or emailing, to let her know if you will or if you will not be planning to attend that meal so that we can adequately plan for food. So that's the first thing I needed to highlight, Consecration Sunday next Sunday. Very important, the second thing for you worshiping in this way on, the, on our online liturgy, next Sunday is also the day that we hope to go live for the first time uh, here at St. Mary's Church. So what that means for you is when you wake up on Sunday mornings or whenever you are accustomed to finding a, our online offering on YouTube or Facebook, here is what you need to do. Go to Facebook, our Facebook page, St. Mary's Kinston, and uh, at the, around 10.30 a.m. is when you will be able to start seeing a live feed video and audio from this church as people gather for this worship service. Uh, there will not be a pre-recorded liturgy that day. So it will not be uh, showing up on our YouTube channel uh, right away, um, but please do come straight to Facebook uh, at, at around 1030, a little bit before, and we look forward to worshiping with you in that way. Uh, please keep this whole process in your prayers, as we certainly have been with ours. There's been a lot of work that's gone into uh, the steps that have taken to get us to where we are, and we pray that God's blessing will be upon it and upon all who will gather with us and worship our Lord in that way. Well, friends, it is good for us to be together right now. Uh, I pray that the Lord is with you in this moment, that you sense his presence with you, and that through this liturgy, you will hear a word of good news for you and your life. I've said these things to you as I greet you. Welcome. <laughs>
Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and blessed be his kingdom now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, increase in us the gifts of faith, hope, and charity, and that we may obtain what you promise. Make us love what you command through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of the prophet Jeremiah. Although our iniquities testify against us, act, O Lord, for your name's sake. Our apostasies indeed are many, and we have sinned against you. O hope of Israel, its savior in time of trouble, why should you be like a stranger in the land, like a trapper turning aside for the night? Why should you be like someone confused, like a mighty warrior who cannot give help? Yet you, O oh Lord, are in the midst of us, and we are called by your name. Do not forsake us. Thus says the Lord concerning this, this people. Truly they have loved to wander. They have not restrained their feet. Therefore the Lord does not accept them. Now he will remember their iniquity and punish their sin. Have you completely rejected Judah? Does your heart loathe Zion? Why have you struck a stand so that there is no healing for us? We look for peace, but find no good. For a time of healing, but there is terror instead. We acknowledge our wickedness, O Lord the iniquity of our ancestors, for we have sinned against you. Do not spurn us for your name's sake. Do not dishonor your glorious throne. Remember and do not break your covenant with us. Can any idols of the nations bring rain? Or can the heavens give showers? 
Is it not you, O Lord, our God? We set our hope on you, for it is you who do all this. The word of the Lord. Please join me in the reading of this portion of Psalm 84. How dear to me is your dwelling, O Lord of hosts. My soul has a desire and a longing for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh rejoice in the living God. The sparrow has found her a house and the swallow a nest where she may lay her young. By the side of your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Happy are they who dwell in your house. They will always be praising you. Happy are the people whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on the pilgrim's way. Those who go through the desolate valley will find it in a place of springs. For the early rains have covered it with pools of water. They will climb from height to height, and the God of gods will reveal himself in Zion. A reading from St. Paul's second letter to Timothy. I am already being poured out as a libation and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. From now on, there is reserved for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. At my first defense, no one came to my support, but all deserted me. May it not be counted against them. But the Lord stood by me and gave me strength, so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. So I was rescued from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and save me for his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Jesus told his parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and regarded others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee standing by himself was praying thus, God, I thank you that I, have, I am not like other people, thieves, rogues, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of my income. But the tax collector standing far off would not even look up to heaven, but was beating his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his home justified rather than the other. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled. And all who humble themselves will be exalted. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Please pray with me. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditation and thoughts of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, for you are our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Let's talk a little bit about self-deception. There once was a man who lost all of his life's savings in a business scheme that had been very elaborately explained and, and deceitfully presented, we now find out, by a con artist. 
And when his investment disappeared and his dreams were shattered, he went to the Better Business Bureau. Why on earth didn't you come to us first? The official asked. Didn't you know about the Better Business Bureau? Oh, yes, said the man sadly. I've always known about you, but I didn't come here because I was afraid you'd tell me not to do it. Now, while that may not be you in the story, I pray that you still do have your life savings, of course. It is, it is absolutely true that we all deal with at least a little self-deception in our lives. Here's another example. There was a pastor one day who, who asked the congregation, how many of you battle with self-deception? And only a few people raised their hands. And then he asked, well, how many of you know someone who is very self-deceived? And of course, nearly everyone there knew someone else who was guilty of self-deception. And I'd be willing to wager that if we paused just for a moment right now, you could conjure up in your mind someone who you think uh, believes that they are maybe thinking more highly of themselves than they ought to, or who thinks that they're funny but they really aren't, or who has a problem but will deny it until the cows come home. And it's kind of humorous, isn't it? That nearly everyone in the room at that, that pastor's church that day could think of other people who were guilty of self-deception, but very few identified themselves as being self-deceived. Maybe there's some evidence of self-deception. So the truth is that it's incredibly difficult to be objective about ourselves, isn't it? We have blind spots about ourselves, all of us do. And even those things that we might be able to see, like the person in the investment story just now, there are some times when we just don't want to see them. But this isn't only us. The Bible and our tenets of the faith tell us that self-deception is endemic to the human race. Everyone deals with it. And as we see in this morning's gospel lesson, religious people are known to especially wrestle with self-deception. Listen to how the parable that Jesus tells and how he begins it. I'm reading from the New International Version here. It says, To some who were confident in their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told them this parable. In other words, Jesus is telling this parable to send a message to people who were self-deceptive, those who were confident in their own righteousness and then looked down on others. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all that I get. Now, let's stop for just a moment. Look at how great the Pharisee is. I mean, really, he's doing so much of what he is supposed to be doing. Listen, if you read Matthew chapter 6, when Jesus is giving his Sermon on the Mount, which includes his teachings about how we are supposed to live, he called out three core spiritual practices. They're so central to the life of faith that Jesus doesn't even command them because he knows that anyone who would become his follower would be doing them anyway. Prayer, fasting, and giving. He doesn't say, you should pray, and then you should fast, and then you should give. No, he says, when you pray, pray like this. And when you fast, this is what you should do. And when you give, Give with these things in mind. These things, these three things, are just basic to living in right relationship with God, with our neighbor, and with the rest of creation. And so look at this Pharisee. Right? He's doing great. He's going up to the temple to pray. He's fasting twice a week, which is more than he's required to by law. He's giving a tenth of all that he gets. This is fantastic, right? Well... Jesus tells us that the Pharisee ends up going home not justified. And more than that, Jesus says that he, like all who exalt themselves, will be brought low and humbled, either in this life or certainly in the next. Something is going to bring this guy down. Now, 
By contrast, there was another person in the temple that day, a tax collector. And, and just for a bit more context here, I wonder, do you know the Beatles song, Tax Man? You listen to the lyrics of that song and you will despise the tax collector. Let, let me tell you how it will be, he says in the song. There's one for you, 19 for me. Should 5% appear too small? Be thankful I don't take it all. If you drive a car, I'll tax the street. If you try to sit, I'll tax your seat. If you get too cold, I'll tax the heat. If you take a walk, I'll tax your feet. Right? The tax collector in Jesus' parable is meant to be about as lovable as this character. Because in Jesus' time, the tax collectors were usually Jewish people who would collect the taxes owed to the occupying Roman government from other Jewish people. And as if that wasn't enough, they were compensated richly. They lived much better than most of their fellow Jews. And they were known for collecting far more for themselves than what was right. They would then skim the extra off the top and keep it. But here's what this tax collector is doing in the temple that day. Unlike the Pharisee, he is anything but confident in himself. He won't even come in close. He stands far away off. He won't look up to heaven. He, he's beating his breast and his prayer to God is this. Be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus tells us that this man leaves the temple justified, forgiven, and even exalted. And so we should wonder, why in the world is this the case? Right? The Pharisee, who is so good at being religious, is going to be humbled one day, and the awful tax collector is, go is going to be exalted? I love how Thomas McKenzie once pointed out that the difference between these two lies in how they are measuring themselves. Did you catch how the Pharisee ends up feeling so good about himself? How that ended up happening? Well, what he's using as his measuring stick, in his little speech, he talks about who he is not. He's measuring himself against the thieves, the evildoers, the adulterers, and even this tax collector. Right? He's measuring himself against other people. And by this comparison, he's pretty great. I mean, apparently he hasn't robbed anyone lately. He's not committing adultery, I guess. Plus, he's checking all the religious boxes. But here's the thing. He's feeling good in this moment because he's comparing himself to his perception of how bad other people are. But how are we doing, but how we are doing relative to other people is not at all the standard to measure our sinfulness or our righteousness, is it? The measure in that case is God's standard, the law. And so if there is a person that we should use to measure against, that person would be Jesus, the complete perfect fulfillment of the law. If the Pharisee were to measure himself against Jesus in terms of ability to be perfect, then he'd be in deep trouble. He wouldn't feel good at all, would he? But he doesn't want to compare himself to Jesus. He would prefer to be self-deceived. He would prefer to tell himself this story that he is right with God because of how he is doing compared to so many other people. By contrast, the tax collector seems to have a better handle on his own true standing with God. He seemed to know the true measurement of a person's sinfulness or righteousness, and it has nothing to do with any other person. He doesn't talk about the even worse people around that he could think of. He doesn't make any excuses about his own situations, no. He just truly feels the weight of his imperfection. And so he humbly falls to his knees and he says, have mercy on me. Now think about this for a moment. Which of these two people goes home from the temple and feels justified. And here's something for all of us to think about today. Right? It's the Pharisee, right? He's not justified, but he feels justified. And here's where the rubber hits the road for us who are religious, right, too. 
Isn't it so easy for us to look at the Pharisee and shake our heads and say, thank God I'm not like that Pharisee. We hear this parable from Jesus and our knee-jerk reaction is to say, thank you, Lord, that I'm not like that Pharisee in that parable that you told me about being humble and not looking down on other people. And the reason why this is so difficult is because it is so easy for all of us to be self-deceived about our relationship with God. Many of us are self-deceived because we, too, compare ourselves to things other than Jesus. So how do we get to the right place? Thomas McKenzie offers this really simple and quite powerful recommendation that rings true to me, too. In that same Sermon on the Mount, that Jesus tells us about how to live, there is an incredible line in there that says, Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. And hopefully as we read that line, we won't say, Yep, got that covered. I'm perfect. Wouldn't that be the pinnacle of self-deception? No, hopefully we will think to ourselves, I am not perfect. I'm not there. And then we say, Jesus, have mercy on me, a sinner. That's what Jesus calls us to, pouring ourselves out to him, falling on his mercy. And the good news is that the Lord is gracious, abounding in mercy, steadfast love. And he has told us that the humble will be exalted. That's a promise of God. That truly is good news. And so that's the advice for us religious who are confident in our own righteousness and may be tempted to look down on other people. But there are also people who are not like the righteous or not like the religious. There are people who wrestle not with self-righteousness, but with self-hatred too. Who believe themselves to be worthless who think that no one could help them measure up, nor would even want to. There are people who believe that God himself would never take time to care or to love or to be concerned for them. This is the tax collector in the parable, right? We can imagine that when he went home from the temple that day, he didn't feel any better because there was no one who told him the good news. Maybe that's how you feel today, too. And if so, listen to the good news of Jesus. You are loved. You are loved by God right now, exactly as you are, before any other transformation or change occurs in your life, right now. There is nothing that you can ever do to make God love you more. Because God loves you, and he cares for you, and he put himself on a cross for you. You are welcome and accepted and beloved exactly as you are. Friends, this is the gospel that Jesus came to bring to each of us. And in just a moment, as we gather, as we remember those who are gathering at the 1030 service today, we will be celebrating that baptism of Wells Means. And in that moment, we celebrate these truths that I've been talking about just now. And they're the truth for him and for his parents and his sponsors, just as they are the truth for you and for me. We are not perfect. And so we seek God's help to become better. And this leads to forgiveness and to freedom in Christ and to peace that only God and his Holy Spirit can give. I've said these things to you this day in the name of God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear friends, this is usually the part of the service where we would say together the Nicene Creed, an affirmation of our faith. But because Wells Means was baptized at our 1030 liturgy today, we will take this moment to reaffirm or renew our baptismal covenant. Uh, That uh, includes an affirmation of the faith through the words of the Apostles' Creed. If you have not yet been baptized, I invite you to listen carefully. Read these words as well in the bulletin. 
and discern, ask God, is this the life that you are called to live? And if so, uh, I would love nothing more than to be able to share in conversation and prayer with you about any steps that you might be called to be taking towards being baptized yourself. Uh, if you are already baptized, then let us renew our baptismal vows. Do you reaffirm your renunciation of evil and renew your commitment to Jesus Christ? I do. Do you believe in God the Father? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God? I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in God, the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Will you continue in the apostles' teaching and fellowship, in the breaking of the bread, and in the prayers? I will, with God's help. Will you persevere in resisting evil, and whenever you fall into sin, repent and return to the Lord? I will, with God's help. Will you proclaim by word and example the good news of God in Christ? I will, with God's help. Will you seek and serve Christ in all persons, loving your neighbor as yourself? I will, with God's help. Will you strive for justice and peace among all people and respect the dignity of every human being? I will, with God's help. May Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has given us a new birth by water and the Holy Spirit and bestowed upon us the forgiveness of sins, keep us in eternal life by his grace in Christ Jesus our Lord. Prayers of the People, Form 3, found on page 387 of the Book of Common Prayer. Father, we pray for your holy Catholic Church. That we may all be in line. Grant that every member of the Church may truly and humbly serve you. That your name may be glorified. We pray for Justin, the Archbishop of Canterbury, for Michael, our presiding bishop, Bob, our diocesan bishop, Tom, our rector, Greg, our deacon, John, our postulant for holy orders, and for all bishops, priests, and deacons. That they may be faithful ministers of your word and sacrament. We pray for Joe, our president. Roy, our governor, Don, our mayor, and for all who govern and uphold authority in the nations of the world. That there may be justice and peace on the earth. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake. That our works may find favor in your sight. Have compassion in all on all who are named on the St. Mary's prayer list and on all those who suffer from any grief or trouble. That they may be delivered from their distress. Give to the departed eternal rest. Let light perpetually shine upon them. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. May we also come to share in in our parish cycle of prayer, we pray for the prayer shawl ministry as the work of their hands and the prayers of their hearts. Seek to affirm your presence, O Lord, with all people, no matter how challenging the situation may be. May the recipients of the prayer shawl be cradled in love, kept in joy, and wrapped in love. Lord, in your mercy. Hear us. 
Let us pray for our own needs and those of others. Almighty and eternal God, ruler of all things in heaven and earth, mercifully accept the prayers of your people and strengthen us to do your will through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us an offering and sacrifice to God. Dear friends, I invite you now to join in an act of spiritual communion, whereby we seek with heart and body to make our full communion with God, beginning with the words our Lord himself taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Grant us peace. Please pray with me. In union, O Lord, with your faithful people at every altar of your church, where the Holy Eucharist is now being celebrated, we desire to offer to you praise and thanksgiving. We remember your death, Lord Christ. We proclaim your resurrection. We await your coming in glory. And since we cannot receive you today in the sacrament of your body and blood, we beseech you to come spiritually into our hearts. Cleanse and strengthen us with your grace, Lord Jesus, and let us never be separated from you. May we live in you and you in us, in this life and in the life to come. Let us pray. God of love, who for our redemption gave your only begotten Son to the death of the cross, and by his glorious resurrection have delivered us from the power of our enemy, grant us so to die daily to sin, that we may evermore live with him in the joy of his risen life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Every breath is a gift. And we only have so many moments to gladden the hearts of those who traveled away with us. So be swift to love. Make haste to be kind. And the blessings of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you now and always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you.